The Contractor's Secret Weapon weekly podcast with your hosts, Dave Negri. This program is dedicated to helping contractors, remodelers, painters, roofers, roof cleaners, and business owners in the construction industry gain an unfair advantage over the competition. This program supplies you with information that the competition doesn't even know exists. This session brought to you by ContractorsSecretWeapon.com. Hey, this is Dave Negri with uh, Contractor Secret Weapon, and today I have a, a very interesting guest, a very special guest, uh, Dr. Cleet uh, Bulock. And uh, Dr. Cleet is um, an educator and uh, has a uh, his own consulting agency called the Professional Development and Assessment Center, which the agency provides training to improve leadership skills in human relations, conflict management, and group management. So, you know, if you're having a challenge with employees and uh, you're not the type of leader that you think you need to be, then I think that this may be the place for you today. And uh, so, Dr. Clee, I want to thank you for being with us and being willing to talk about the nine forms of power that, that you talk about so much. Hey, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Well, that's great, and I'm glad that uh, that we can have you on today. So, you've uh, you've talked about in your in your book. And you sent me a chapter about the nine techniques for m- motivating, and we're going to call employer employ employees, um, and we're just talking about people. And I know you deal in the educational world, but that's still people. So how can we relate those nine forms of power to our employees as, as business owners? Well, leadership, uh, no matter whether you're a parent or a teacher or a principal or anyone um, leading a group, a minister, or what have you, <clears throat> your goal is to motivate those under you to accomplish organizational goals or to accomplish personal goals. And in order to do that, you must use a form of power. And many people do that instinctively. They don't even know that they're using a form of power. They mm-hmm. just do it because it's their personality. It's something they've done since they were kids growing up. They develop a leadership style. And there are basically oh, four main leadership styles. Um <clears throat> There's the directive style, the non-directive style, the collaborative style, and the compromise style. The collaborative style is the one that most people prefer uh, because the leader there works with the people below them to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And in any organization, you have organizational needs and then you have personal needs. The needs of the people, they have basically five needs. You have five needs. And I have five needs. All kids have five needs. Everybody has five needs. And I'll just tick those off real sure. quick. We won't go into those uh, too, too much in depth. We can come back to them uh, if you want. Um, and these have been discussed since the 19th century, the philosophers who talk about why do people behave the way they do. <laughs> yeah. And the first guy, he says, well, that's easy. They want to live. So being alive, being safe. Not having anxiety attacks and so forth is a basic need. you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. Number two, moments of happiness. Is it important that there are moments of happiness in your life? Oh, yeah. It's, it keeps that things interesting, second, yeah. That was the second need. Ah. Along comes Nietzsche, a famous late 19th century philosopher. Says, yeah, I agree with that. And you want to live and you want to be happy, but there's a more basic need. And the basic need he came up with was power. He says, people want power. Without power, you don't feel good. Well, I equate power to control. Okay. And I just want to ask you for a second to think about what would it, what is it like for you, um, <clears throat> uh, Dave? What is it like for you when you... Don't have, you feel like you have no control over your life. Oh, it's a bummer, big time. And then on the opposite side, what's it like when you feel like you have complete control? Well, uh, when I feel complete control, I, I feel more productive, more useful, yeah. more uh, well, energized. It's, it's really, yeah. But everybody's control needs tend to be a little different. There are those who are control freaks. Yeah. 
and there are those who want someone to tell them what to do. So it varies all over this wide spectrum. But in an organization, almost all people in that organization have some control needs. So the leader has to give some control to the people in the organization to so those needs are being met. So that's the third need. Fourth is caring. People have a, a need to believe that other people care about them. It's a nurturing thing. Yeah. Your par- you need to know that your parents care about you, that your spouse cares about you. And so if a leader in an organization comes across as self-centered and not caring about employees, that is not motivational. That need of caring isn't being met by the employees. Okay. Um, Our President Obama did not come across as a caring president. He seemed to come across more as a self-centered, caring about self more than he cared about the people in the U.S. But anyway, that's strictly an opinion. But caring is a fourth basic need. And here's the fifth basic need, purpose. What, and, and I'm not the only one to come up with this. Um, Mehmet Oz, Dr. Mehmet Oz comes up with the uh, uh, Warren, uh, the Purpose Driven Life. Uh-huh. And yeah. uh, the um, Tibetan monk says, life with no purpose is no life. So you got purpose carrying control, happiness, and survival or anxiety, fear for self. Those are the five basic needs. Control is one of those needs. So we have nine ways to control. All leaders have nine ways to control. The Many leaders resort to the controlling forms of control. Okay, here they are. Uh, position power, reward power, and coercion power or punishment. Okay. Okay. Those are the three main controlling forms of power. When a leader uses those forms of power, the people under them have no choice. They have to do it. Now, here's an interesting form of power that goes along with that, and it is also a control form of power. It's called connection power. Okay, David, are you married? Yes, I am. Okay, let's suppose, and you've got kids? Yes, I do. Okay, let's suppose your wife says to one of your kids, you just wait till your dad comes home. I'm going to tell him what you did, and he's going to take care of you. Yep, they, they, that, that was a reality when they was little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you come home, and your wife tells you what one of your kids did, and you said, well, I don't, what's so bad about that? I don't see, I don't see where, where that's a problem. <laughs> Connection power, what happens to your wife's position power? Oh, it, it gets shot down the holes, it's just like, yeah, yeah, no, it's not good. It's not good you, for anybody. You have just taken her out. Yeah. Okay, now what happens in many classrooms? Teacher sends the kid to the principal or assistant principal for discipline, and they do nothing about it. The kid goes back to the classroom, and nothing has happened. What happens to that teacher's position power? It's deteriorated, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, that would be the same thing for, for yeah. an owner of a business. So, con- Connection power is a very real form of power because the people who give you your position power also give you the, the ability to reward and coerce or punish. Those mm. are the four main forms of power that many leaders use. Uh, <clears throat> our new president, big on the four controlling forms of power, but he seems to be using some of the freeing forms of power, too. And let me share those with you. Okay. Information, information is power, right? Yes, it is. It's the, it's the only form of power that is inexhaustible. And, and he provides a lot of information. Sometimes uh, he's accused of providing wrong information, but he provides a lot of information. Number two, expertise. He is known as a person who has expertise along with finances and organization and management. And uh, uh, so he uses that a lot. To He used that a lot to get elected. Yes. Then you have personality. 
He has an interesting personality because he can get a lot done just by asking people to do it. Of course, there are a lot of people who don't like him. No, but that, personality is a freeing form of power, and many leaders can go up to an employee and just say, hey, will you give me a hand with this? Will you do this or will you do that? And they'll say, oh, sure, I'll do that yeah. for you. You see, that's a freeing form of power when you ask, right? Yes. Okay, so we've got expertise when you demonstrate how to do something, and they see it and they say, well, I can do that. And that's freeing too, right? Yes. Here's a an interesting form of power. It's called ego power. Now, this... This is my own creation. I've not seen this anywhere. Okay. Uh, it's in my book. All of the other forms of power have been described by somebody over time. And that's described in my book, Who Came Up With Connection okay. Power, Who Came Up With this and that forms of power. Okay. Ego power. <clears throat> and I'm sure, David, you, you've stroked your kids' egos a time or two, haven't you? Yeah, and I probably stroked my own, too. <laughs> uh, you tell them how great they are at doing this and yeah. will they do, will they help you out with that right yeah and they they say well yeah uh there's an an interesting twist on ego power it's called the negative ego stroke you ever heard of it uh, i probably have if you explain it but not and it's just the the well, if you give me a definition of how it's used, okay. I would probably say, yeah, I'd probably. What if, you, what if you went to one of your kids and say, you're a wuss, you can't do that. Yeah. The negative ego stroke. Yeah, if your okay. If has got a good ego, what's your kid going to say? Well, he's going to be deflated because of the way that they, they look up to me. So, yeah, that's, it's, and, and depending on the age and their personality. So they're either going to yeah. bow down you or they're going to tell you you're wrong. Depends on the age and, and the many yeah. of the things in the culture you grew up in. So, yeah. you got to know how to use the negative ego stroke because, as you said, they could be deflated. On right. the other hand, they could puff up their chest. What do you mean I'm a wuss? I do that. I'll show you. Yeah. And they bust their back to show you that you're wrong. Right. Many coaches use this uh, to get their teams pumped up. Look, we've got a heart. We've got a match coming up. I know you guys are worried about it, and maybe, what do you think? Do you think we can beat them, or do you think they're going to beat us? And you try to get them to puff up their ego and say, yeah, coach, we can take them. We're going to get them. So that's the negative ego stroke, and it's very powerful. And in the book, I described Muhammad Ali when he was in the fourth grade. His teacher said to him, you'll never amount to anything. When he won the Golden Glove at the Cuba <laughs> Olympics, guess who? Where the first person he went back to see yeah. was that teacher. Yeah. My... Said, you told me I wasn't going to amount to anything. Look at this. Yeah. So the negative ego stroke is very powerful. Here's the fifth form of power. It's called more power. And, of course, as an administrator, a principal, or a leader, you want to have moral power in place. And it's called what is the right thing to do. Okay. So within any organization, you've got, you've got things that everyone has agreed on. This is the way this organization operates. In a family, there have to be rules and regulations, and they have to be agreed on of what, what is the right thing to do in this family. How do you treat mom? How do you treat dad? What's her view? What are your job responsibilities? When are you going to go to bed? And on and on with the rules that there yeah. are in a house. It's called the rules. Or the norms. But it's really a moral power. And when the person who doesn't do what they're supposed to do, the the leader says, hey, wait a minute. What's the right thing to do here? And you ask them to recall what is the right thing to do. And many times the employee will, will say, oh, yeah, I forgot. And they will correct the behavior. So there you have the nine forms of power. Five are freeing. Subordinate is, is independent of the leader, is free to choose, and you have the four controlling. Most leaders should use the freeing forms of power. And when those don't work, what does the leader have to do? Right, he's got to, switch, both, to switch to the other. He has to switch to the controlling, because if they do not, the leader loses the power. 
When the leader has position power and things aren't going right, they must use position power. If they don't, they lose the power. Right. Now, do you and think, some, Dan, have you seen, and I'm sure a lot has your personality and the way, you know, the way people, um, just, I'm just going to go with their personalities. I'm not going to go anything else. Um, that they're more, have a more propensity to use the, uh, the negative side of power than the positive side of power, or do you see a good fit? Well, most teachers in most classrooms in the United States use the controlling forms of power. Right. And, of course, I have made many presentations on this to many schools, and I'll say, which form of power do you use the most? And most teachers will say personality. Yeah, it's their personality to be controlling. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, But... Beyond that, they have never really thought about the forms of power, mm-hmm. and people don't have to. They, they they have survived all their lives using the forms of power they have, but when things don't work, it's nice to have this framework of nine forms so you can go back and reflect on, on what didn't I use, what could I have used to get people to do what they're supposed to do, because that's what leaders do. Right. And, uh, yeah, they I'm motivate sure. their... They motivate the people under them to do what they're supposed to do, to meet the needs of the organization and to meet the needs of the people in the organization. And I think that, that a good leader would would take a hold of these principles that you that you just outlined and uh, look and say, okay, um, how am I going to get the best response out of, whomever I get the best response out of, whether it be a teacher, or whether it be an employer, whether it be, uh, I'm just saying like a clergyman or something like that. I mean, it's it sounds like that. that That's uh, very true. You know. Here was a technique used as a leader that uh, really paid off big time for me. Remember, in my both of my books, servant leadership is the theme throughout the books. Um, the one on creating the culture and climate, the one on enhancing the culture and the climate. Certain leadership, it comes across, is a person who comes across as there for the people. The opposite of that, and many leaders fall into that, are are self-serving leaders. They may not be self-serving leaders, but they come across that way. Right. Um, you know, like I said earlier, Obama, to me, came across as self-serving. Now, I'm sure if you asked him whether he was self-serving or not, he would have said, no, I'm servant. I'm here to serve the needs of the people of the United States. But how does he come across? And I give a lot of suggestions in the books on how to come across as a servant leader. Here's one of them, the one that I use the most frequently. And any time I went into a new situation where I had a new group of people, I gave them three three by five cards, and I said, "Hey guys, I want you to write on each card an expectation you have of me as your new leader, as your new superintendent, as your new principal, uh-huh. as your new professor." And I had my graduate student the first day in class. What do you expect of me as your professor? And they look at me and say, "You want us to tell you what we expect?" <laughs> I says, "Yeah, I, I want to know what you expect of me, because." You know, in any leadership situation, you no longer have a white middle class group out there. You've got blacks, whites, rich, poor, yeah. Latinos, Orientals. You've got a mix yeah. of people that you are leading, and you have no clue what they expect you. So with this technique, you get at what they value and believe should happen regarding your leadership. I call it identifying the existing culture in the group you're leading. Because values and beliefs is what makes up the culture. The values and beliefs of the people make up the culture in that group. So I get all these cards, and since there's one thing on each card, I sort them into common piles. And I paraphrase what each, what's in each pile. Uh-huh. I go back to them. And I says, this is what you guys expect of me. And I share it with them. Usually I'll come up with eight, nine, or ten expectations that there is agreement on. And if I can meet those expectations, I will tell them, look, I'm going to do my best to meet these expectations. And if there is an expectation I cannot meet, I say, here's an expectation you have of me that I cannot meet. And I explain why. Okay. But here's here's what I've, I've done as the leader. I have 
I have given them an example that I am open, that I trust them, I'm taking a risk, I'm listening to them, I care about them, okay? So I'm beginning their relationship, the interpersonal relationship with people below me, all right? Uh, does that make sense to you? It does. It's sort of like, uh, it's, uh, as I'm thinking, as, as I'm listening to you, it's sort of um, a reverse approach to the way things are usually done. Because when, the, you know, a boss or goes in, the first thing off, you know, this is what I expect. Our new employee, this is what I expect. But you never, you never take into consideration, and I guess this is from the servant leadership standpoint, of, okay, they're here, what do they expect of me? And now you can ultimately go because and say this is what I after uh, this is what I expect but you're you're knowing where they're coming from that's right yeah well it's the beginning of a relationship yeah uh, it, it's not the uh, it's, it's I'm coming I'm trying to show them that I am a servant leader that I am here to work for them that they are not here to work for me that I'm not self-serving. So I'm trying to establish this culture and climate that we are in this together. Um, Sometime down the road, maybe six months down the road, I go to them again. And I say, I'd like to know how you guys perceive me coming across as your leader. Okay. I want you to complete two sentences as often as you wish. And I give them a piece of paper. And one of the sentences is, Dr. B is a good leader because, complete that sentence as many times as you wish. The second sentence is, Dr. B would be a better leader if, complete that sentence as many times as you want. So I'm getting feedback on on how I came across as a leader. And it's actually very valid feedback. Now, I I may have one or two disgruntled employees who are going to rip me. Sure. And I've got probably a couple out there who just love me. Um, but I can sort through that. And I can gather from them um, how they perceive me coming across. Now, I did this as a school superintendent at the end of the year. So I went to them at the beginning of the year. What do you expect of me as your leader? Mm-hmm. I only did that the first year. And then each year after that, I did the... Came, I, I did the, what I call force field analysis. That's uh, something Kurt Lewin, L-E-W-I-N-K-U-R-T-L-E-W-I-N, came up with back in the late 50s. And you can get on the web and look up force field analysis, and it, it gets pretty sophisticated. Uh, but this is a very simplistic version of that. It's good leader because, be a better leader if. Uh, anyone listening to that can can uh, come up with that with your kids. Mm-hmm. You can say, he's a good father because, would he a better father if, and let the kids respond. <laughs> <laughs> if you de- are brave enough to do that. But a minister can do that. A teacher can do that. A counselor can do that. Anybody out there uh, who has people under them can do that. Well, You'll get valid feedback. It's kind okay? of And the next time you do it, maybe a year later. Yeah. You can count how many positives you've got. It's a leader because and would be a better leader if. Because when you get this feedback, you can you can say, oh, boy, I didn't know about that. I, uh-huh. I think I can change that. Yeah. And so each year, the positives or the forces for you being a good leader increase and the forces against decrease. So that's a powerful uh, leadership technique because as a leader – the hardest thing you can do is get honest feedback. Uh, <clears throat> most people below you are will not give you honest feedback because they don't know how you're going to handle it. Right. And the people above you, you don't know where they're coming from sometimes. You know, when I was a school superintendent, I had five to seven board members, depending on the district, and I never knew whose side they were on. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know if, if you know, like one board member's father-in-law uh, was an art teacher and his son-in-law was a coach and his daughter 
was a teacher. So nice. You, I didn't always know what kind of feedback they gave me. So if you want honest feedback, that's force field analysis. It's the best way to get it. Well, it's free. And again, you're coming across as a servant. I'm yeah. here to serve you. But it's freeing for, for your side because you've just opened up the doors to open and honest communication. Which yeah, you want to know what the biggest problem is in most organizations? What's that? It's level and the most demotivating factor in any organization is levels of openness and trust. Yeah. Uh, I write extensively about that and there's a, uh, a survey in my book on how to measure levels of openness and trust in any organization. Did you know that openness has two factors? No. One is uh, tell, and the other is listening. Okay. Uh, now that you mentioned it, it does make sense, but yeah. A lot of people are very open on the telling dimension and low on the listening dimension. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't uh, want to hear it. They just want, they just want to let you know how they feel, but they don't want to hear the results. Yeah. Well, they, we call it the bull in the china shop. Uh-huh. The person who's open on the the uh, telling dimension and not open on the listening. It would appear that uh, President Trump is open on the listening dimension because he's gotten people around him who are telling him what he needs to hear. Uh, yeah. Uh, he's also very open on the telling dimension, isn't he? Yeah, he is. So that's, uh, <laughs> hey, uh, we're in for a ride. Uh, you know. Then we get to, to trust. Yes. Yeah, trust has five dimensions. Uh, how do how do our listeners get a hold of your books? Are they on your web? Well, They're on dot com and Barnes and Noble. They're okay, and we'll we'll put links on our our show notes to the books. And and how can our um, I know you do you do you still do consulting on your uh, let me look it up it, uh, outlet there uh, at your uh, professional development assessment center. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, material on my website okay. at uh, um, westga.edu, Georgia, westg, westga.edu, front slash, up in the left-hand corner of the keyboard, it's a thing called a tilt. Right. And then C. Bulop. That's my website. Anything on there free. Okay, cool. So we'll put that on the show notes so everyone can get in, in touch with it. And there's mm-hmm. uh, in touch with you or, or you know, look at your stuff because it's very interesting. Um, and like we said, we're dealing with people. So and how to uh, keep them motivated, how to deal with them, and how to be better leaders ourselves. So I really appreciate you being with us, uh, Dr. Cleet. This has really been fun. Hey, I've enjoyed being uh, talking with you and interacting with you, David. Excellent. Uh, Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Contractor's Secret Weapon Podcast with Dave Negri. We would love to hear your comments about this episode, so visit us online at www.contractorsecretweapon.com and let us hear your thoughts. If you were listening via iTunes, please leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive, the more other contractors will benefit from this show. Thank you, and see you next time here on the Contractor's Secret Weapon Podcast.